Welcome back to Presume Legal. I am Misha Janice, and this is the recap of trial day 15 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. This morning, Jennifer McCabe retook the stand to start her cross-examination. The defense first established that her family is of the utmost importance to her and that neither Karen nor John O'Keefe are a part of that family. She was asked about her offer to Karen, the defendant, after leaving the Waterfall Bar for her to drive Karen to 34 Fairview. Now, the defense tried to drive the point home that by offering Karen a ride, the witness would have been separating Karen from John. The witness maintained that it was an innocent statement that she made and she wasn't intentionally trying to separate them. Now, we're going to see this a few times, and we've seen it already, where the defense counsel kind of harps on one particular thing that, at the end of the day, is nothing burger. It's almost like they're just trying to make a point out of any little thing. There's so many big issues in this case that could be focused on, but instead they just needle away at some of the little tiny things for a little bit too long. And that is an example of one of them. Next defense counsel asked the witness about her placement of the dark SUV at 34 Fairview when she first saw it. On direct examination, you'll recall, she had testified that when she looked out the window at 34 Fairview, the dark SUV was directly in front of the front door on the street. The defense counsel asked what the witness had told Trooper Proctor about the placement of that dark SUV, and then question her about the conflicting information from Proctor's report. The witness maintained that the dark SUV was directly in front of the front door and that she only told Trooper Proctor the same thing. Now, although the witness testified about seeing a Jeep with a snowplow in front of the house, she testified on her direct examination, Trooper Proctor's report doesn't mention anything about a Jeep with a snowplow being in front of the house. The witness couldn't recall whether she had told Proctor about the Jeep, but if she didn't, it's because he never asked about it. In her prior grand jury testimonies, you'll recall that there are other testimonies that are being brought into this case, and those are being brought in from a federal investigation that we're not allowed to talk about. So in one of those grand jury testimonies, the witness also never mentioned the Jeep, and she said it was because she was never asked about it. She said that she never had a conversation with Higgins or about where his Jeep was parked and that she didn't recall anyone telling her to say that she saw the Jeep parked behind the SUV. Now, this is a case where we're seeing the defense counsel raise an issue that's found or not found in Trooper Proctor's report that the witness that's testifying directly is giving contradicting information about. So we've seen this multiple times with different witnesses that have testified already and who have also spoken with Trooper Proctor. There's definitely some issues with the reporting that he's doing because his reports have differed in a handful of ways already from the witness's statements and the witness's testimony on the stand. Pence then nailed down the exact location that Jen McCabe saw the cars on the street when she first noticed the dark SUV. She said that looking from the street towards the house, it was the dark SUV, then to the right, the Jeep, then Ryan Nagel's truck behind the Jeep. The witness testified that as soon as she saw the dark SUV, she texted John, quote, here. That was at 1227. Ryan Nagel had texted his sister, Julie, that he was at the house at 1223. The witness agreed that the dark SUV was there for at least four minutes then before she noticed it there. In prior testimony, the witness testified that each of the five times she texted John, she got up to look outside, and after the fifth time at 1245, so the sixth time, the SUV was gone. The witness said in that time, 
block between when she first saw the SUV and the time when she looked and it was gone. She never heard anything outside, like screaming, yelling, squealing tires, rubbing engines, a collision. There was nothing out of the ordinary. And there being no obstruction between her and the SUV, she could see the lawn. Now, she started backing away from the fact that she had an unobstructed field of vision that night. So counsel asked her, well, you're looking directly at me right now, right? So she said, yes. So do you think you'd be able to see an alligator if there was one on the ground between us? She answered, yes. Now, I'd like to think that this is a little shout out to Florida because it seems like all these cases have some connection to the Sunshine State and we haven't heard that connection in this case yet. So I'm taking that as our Florida link. All right. Back to the testimony. So defense counsel emphasized that the witness had a clear view of the SUV and each of the six times she went to look outside, there was no body on the lawn. When the witness left 34 Fairview, she testified that she wasn't looking out the front or side window, so she didn't see anything out of the ordinary on the lawn as they passed by it. She said she never heard Julie Nagel say anything about a black blob or a black object being on the lawn, despite being turned around to interact with Julie and with Sarah in the back seat. When the witness got home, she said she went to her bedroom and got on her phone. She said she didn't call anybody, but she did send text messages. Now, at this point, I was gearing up to hear all about the text messages and all of the scrolling that she was doing on her phone. Because as we heard in opening statements, she made some questionable Google searches at that point in time. We haven't heard them yet, but these Google searches supposedly are about how long somebody might live in the snow. How long does it take hypothermia to, to kill somebody in the snow? We didn't get to it today. Sorry. I'm disappointed as well. But her cross-examination will continue tomorrow, so I can maybe put money on the fact that we'll hear it tomorrow. Now, if you watch the trial at all, you'll notice that there's a lot of jumping around. Nothing is being done chronologically. This gets on my nerves, but I understand why it's being done like this, right? Defense counsel is keeping the witness on her toes, jumping from topic to topic so that she, she doesn't, or any of the other witnesses, they don't get too comfortable in one topic or they're able to predict what's coming next. They can't predict what co what's coming next. We can't predict what's coming next. So it's just literally, and they apologize. They say, sorry to be jumping around, but let me go back to this time or that time. And it's it's kind of hard to keep it straight. It would be nice to have it chronologically, but by now, I think with all the testimony that we do have 15 days in and on our 38th witness, which Jen McCabe is, sorry, she's our 39th witness. We do have somewhat of a timeline beginning to be made, beginning to be clarified, right? So... The witness admitted that she knows about the Life360 app. That was the next topic of discussion. In prior testimony, in grand jury testimony, this witness had praised the app as being a good parenting tool because it works like a GPS for everywhere you go, or in her case, for everywhere her kids go. So she was asked where her daughter Allie went after she dropped off Colin Albert. She says she didn't know. She didn't check the Life360 app to see where Allie had went. But she believed that her daughter told her, and she believed her daughter when the daughter told her that she came home. She came directly home after dropping Colin off. Now, we previously got testimony. I think it was with Allie McCabe where the Life360 records do not indicate that Allie McCabe went directly home. I believe it had her 
driving around and going to the high school and getting back home much later that night. So that's still something that needs to be clarified perhaps by an expert. The witness said she has a very specific memory of the defendant saying, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him at the scene. So my question is, if her memory was so impacted by Karen Reed saying, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, how come she didn't remember that when she first spoke with Officer Lake? On another note, the witness testified to an April 2022 grand jury, and during that testimony, said that she didn't recall if she ever mentioned the defendant's supposed admission there either, despite it being so impactful, right? In that grand jury, she testified to 12 different times what the defendant said that night. And each of those times were the defendant questioning whether she could have hit John, whether she did hit John, including one time when the defendant was speaking with the female EMT and asking those same questions over and over. Could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Is he dead? So 12 times under oath, the witness testified about the defendant's statements. And not once did she testify that Karen said she hit him. The witness said she wasn't specifically asked in the grand jury whether Karen made the admission, but she admitted that she never told the grand jury that Karen said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. The defense played the 911 call that the witness made just after 6 a.m. On the call, she said that John had gotten out of the car there. Side note. This is not what she said on Friday on her direct examination when she testified that Karen had told her that they got into an argument at Waterfall and Karen left him at Waterfall. So there's some discrepancy between what Karen allegedly told her on the phone and what she told the 911 operator. She said that she called her sister, Nicole, at 6.07 and 6.08, but she swears the phone was not answered, despite the Cellbrite records indicating the calls were answered for approximately a combined total of 15 seconds. The witness also called Brian Albert at 6.23. Cellbrite records show that that call was not answered. She said she didn't leave voicemails for any of those calls. The defense asked about the fact that the witness's calls to her sister, Nicole, were deleted from her phone log before she gave her phone to the police. She snarkily replied that there were 20 deleted calls and she didn't remember if those two were included. Then she accused the defense of cherry picking those two calls out. Let me tell you, this witness was trying her best to talk around the defense and give excuses for all the things he was calling her out on. He finally had to ask her to stop editorializing her comments and just answer the questions and only the questions that he asked. Now, I'm sure the jury caught on to what she was doing. Defense counsel really didn't have to point it out. Her being combative says more about her as a witness than anything and plays into the level of credibility that they'll give her. Back to the testimony. The witness was asked about the moment she went into the house after the officer asked her to wake the homeowners. She testified that when she woke up, Brian and Nicole Albert, she did not know where Chloe the dog was. She had walked into the front door with no one expecting her, up the stairs, and burst into a dark room. She was basically an intruder, yet she had no memory of a 70-pound German shepherd reacting to her entry to the home nor the room where the Alberts both testified they, including the dog, were all sleeping. She did not see the dog. My guess, the dog was not there. The witness testified that while she was allowed to have a private conversation with Brian and Nicole Albert at that time before the police even went into the house, she didn't tell them and they didn't tell her what to say. She denied having a conversation with them about deleting their phone calls. She admitted that she and her friends and family were allowed to sit and discuss the events of the situation without the police being there. That's after Officer Lank left. 
The defense drove home the point that there was no investigation occurring when there should have been, which goes to a defense theory of the case. Everybody was allowed to speak with each other. No guidelines were in place, even though Karen allegedly had made this admission in front of these witnesses and even in front of an officer outside that she had hit this man who was clearly not going to survive. The defense next brought out John's phone call records. It showed the calls between Jen McCabe and John O'Keefe at 1214 and 1218, where they discussed the address of the party and how to get how to get there after leaving the waterfall bar. According to the call records, there were six calls up until 1250 with John's phone. She was then given a copy of her phone records and looked through it. We learned that on the report, there is no record of the calls between her and John, which appears to mean that all the calls on her phone to John between 1214 and 1250, including the ones giving him directions, were deleted. Deleted from her phone. Defense wrapped this up by concluding that the witness deleted and sanitized her phone before turning her phone over to the police several days after the incident. The witness said that before handing her phone over to officers, she only deleted personal text messages between her and her daughter per the officer's permission. She denied deleting any phone calls with her family or with John. She admitted to having a group chat with the family and friends that started on February 1st, and she was asked about the message from her husband, Matt, where he texted the group to tell Chris Albert to tell Channel 4, who was at his pizza shop, that, quote, the guy never went in the house, close quote. Now, when I heard the context of the entire text message, Matt McCabe's testimony from last week, which seemed extremely unbelievable at that time, seems a lot more believable. But why wouldn't the prosecutor have made the context clear by reading the entire message? Was that just bad lawyering or did Lolly just miss it? It doesn't make sense. Back to the testimony. The witness was asked about a text message she wrote to the group on February 1st that said, quote, Carrie's hair going over timeline, close quote. The witness said they were trying to figure out what happened to John at Carrie's request. Carrie went over to Jen McCabe's house and they were sitting down and trying to work out the details. After the timeline was created, Carrie, while still at Jen's house, gave an interview to the police. The witness said she texted the chat that, quote, she's telling them, all caps, everything, close quote. She said that she was overhearing Carrie speak to the police on the phone and that she was shocked and horrified by the stuff Carrie was saying about John and Karen's relationship. While that was happening, the witness was reporting back to the group chat. The witness was asked about this under oath at a grand jury, and the witness testified then that she didn't remember what Carrie was talking about. Today, she claimed that since that prior testimony, she now remembers what Carrie had said. The defense counsel argued that the, quote, everything meant the timeline that the two went over and their colluded story that they had come up with. The witness denied that and said the everything referred to the comments about Karen and John's relationship. Now, there's a bunch of back and forth about whether the witness was eavesdropping on the Carrie interview the police were having at, at Jen's house. Jen said she wasn't eavesdropping and she couldn't hear what was being said. But then she also said that she heard Carrie telling them about Karen's relationship. So which was it? Again, the witness came off as hostile, especially when she made statements to defense counsel like, the story you're trying to spin is not the truth. Yikes. Defensiveness did her no favors. After that, the witness told us about how Carrie's daughter is friends with Sergeant Lank's daughter and how on the 30th, so the day after the incident, the witness and Carrie dropped Carrie's daughter off at Sergeant Lank's house. Yes, the same Lank who was the first officer to speak with the witnesses 
at the Albert home and who was also good friends with the Albert at Lank. When Carrie's daughter got dropped off, allegedly Lank's wife came out to the car, got in and spoke with them, specifically Carrie, their friends, to ask how the O'Keefe parents were doing and how they were doing. And allegedly, that's all they discussed. Witness then said that she and her daughter, Allie, went to the Commonwealth a couple weeks ago and described this meeting to multiple people in the Commonwealth's office. She and Allie were going to the office to prep for this trial. And that's when she relayed the incident of visiting the Lank household uh, the day after the incident. Now, this was the first time she reported the incident to anyone for any purpose. I guess she didn't feel it was fitting to advise anybody, any investigator that, um, you know, that she had an off the books meeting outside Lang's house. The defense next asked the witness about a bunch of missed calls from her phone to John's phone between 1229 and 1250 a.m. In Prior testimony that the witness gave in grand juries, she was asked about these calls and she referred to them as butt dials. Y'all, there were seven calls to John O'Keefe's phone in a 19 minute span of time. The witness said she didn't remember making any of those calls. This is also the span of time when she allegedly was going back and forth from her seat or from the kitchen area to the front door and observing the dark SUV parked in different spots outside the Albert home. So how she's able to have multiple butt dials at the same time that she is up walking around to the front door and sending text messages to John is inexplicable to me. I have no idea. But this is where the half day of day 15 ended. So tomorrow morning, we will continue with Jen McCabe's cross-examination and hopefully get some more information about these calls, these butt dials, uh, her Google searches, and some of the other uh, critical evidence that we heard would be presented in the opening statement. So at the end of day 15, Jen McCabe is still on the stand. We talked about deleted phone calls, a meeting at Officer Lang's house that was new news to everybody except that one person at the Commonwealth. The off the bus meeting that happened to occur the day after Nicole Albert also texted the group chat that, quote, we'll know more tomorrow. So, yes, there was a group chat between Jen and Matt McCabe and Brian and Nicole Albert. And we finally got the full context of that group chat and the Channel 4 comment that Matt McCabe testified to on redirect. There were a lot of group texts that were introduced today and Jen McCabe established that, you know, this was her little circle in which she wanted to keep information and discussions close to the circle. So while they texted some things, the text messages also indicated that we'll speak about this in person because she said that she didn't want to put everything down in text messages but she described these people as her close circle. This close circle that was trying to figure things out, how John passed, but the circle did not include Karen Reed in, in that close-knit group. It seems that there were Cellbrite phone records also from John's phone extraction that showed multiple calls from Jen McCabe in the midnight hour. And from Jen's phone extraction, those phone calls were not there. So at the end of day 15, we still have tons of questions and not many answers. We're still in a holding pattern waiting for the Commonwealth to make its case. I am waiting with bated breath. And if they don't do it soon, I'm not going to be able to breathe any longer. How long will it take for them to present evidence that substantiates 
their claims that Karen Reed, the defendant in this case, killed either intentionally or manslaughter John O'Keefe. We're still waiting. So on to day 16 tomorrow, I truly hope that you will join me again as I recap that day. And thank you for joining me today. Until the next drop, peace.